so Birthright is it comes out 1995, and I discovered because of this thing, which was actually quite effective way to promote a campaign. I mean, maybe I should make one of these for the Chain of Minuros game coming up. Uh, and we'll talk about more, by the way, about the D&D campaign in the next month, because the one that we're going to play, because uh, you, you folks funded it. That was part of the stream. That was part of the Kickstarter. Was funding the stream. So you'll get uh, you know the same the same information I'm trickling out to my players to help them make a decision when they make a character. I will send to you guys. So this was the Birthright Conspectus, and it was really cool. And it showed you here are all the products that are going to come out, and um, and it says. <laughs> This is, this is interesting. I'm not sure when the last time I looked at this was. Probably 23 years ago. But you open it up, and it says, uh, Birthright, a war game, a tactical war game with role-playing, which is not how we played it. We didn't really do... We used a, um, a, my bra friend Brad's brother's Matt's mass combat rules. Um, we didn't use any of the mass combat rules from this game. But that's the hook of birthright the hook of birthright is that you run your player is running a country you're a count or a baron you're running a county or a barony and there's a it's a the empire has fallen and so you're off on your own you your territory that was once part of a larger empire is now completely independent um and let's see what this says i'm not going to read this whole thing tsr the tactical studies rules uh was the company that invented D &D. TSR has never before created an AD&D advanced... Look how much translation I have to do just in order to read about this campaign setting. What is TSR? Uh, AD&D Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, the game in the 80s, basically 80s D&D, has never before created an AD&D world quite like that of Birthright. That is true. Here you can be a king, a noble, a prelate, a guildmaster, a great wizard, or a royal herald. I mean... That should sound familiar to those of you back in the Kickstarter. Are you the leader of your own kingdom and domain? No, I'm sorry. You are. Why did I make that a question? You are the leader. Of, you are the leader of your own kingdom or domain. That's what they would call them. They would call them domains. And it is you who has the power to wage war or preserve peace. At a single command, armies march and kingdoms fall. Thus, the birthright game is a mixture of strategy wargaming and role playing. Eh, but is it really? Because I think most people who play Birthright ran it the way I did. They just ran it like an RPG, and there wasn't really a lot of uh, wargaming elements in it. They tried to graft something on here, and this you are going to see in the uh, thanks YOTC. You are going to see in the in the years to come because it won't it probably won't happen this year. But the supplement to Strongholds and Followers is called Warfare, and it's a system for running war in Dungeons and Dragons. And you'll see when that comes out the difference between how I think that should be done and how these folks think it should be done. These folks, I don't know if it's Rich Baker, whose idea the war stuff was, but it's his campaign setting. Birthright is Rich Baker's campaign setting. He's a great designer. He's one of those guys where every time I saw his name on something, I was like, ooh. Um, and I don't, is that not, it's not the same Rich Baker. Is that, does he share a name with the guy that did Eberron? If he doesn't, they're very close, but it's not the same dude. So this is not the same guy who did, uh, who did Eberron, which became a pretty popular setting. Um, the birthright setting is distinctive in several areas. I could just read this thing and call the stream over. First, we developed this concept of bloodlines. Bloodlines were created when the heroes at the Battle of Mount, Mount Deismar were imbued with the essence of the gods. A character's bloodline is a heritage of his divine power. So when you made it, when you rolled a character, if you were, if you opted, this was a personal choice because, and in, in my in my campaign, it's fascinating to me how, like the Strongholds Kickstarter, you will discover that only one or two of your players are going to want to build a stronghold and the rest are going to be like, no, that's okay. I like being an itinerant campaigner. Um, just like that, when I ran Birthright, only one or two of my players, uh, like three or three or four out of seven, want, and it would change or evolved over time, but it started off as uh, three. Only three of my players wanted to run a domain. They were The rest were perfectly happy to just be an adventurer. So that's an important point. You as a dungeon master, you may get excited about this stuff, but you will discover that the, the people at your table are all there for different reasons. If you have six players, that's six different reasons that you have to have in the back of your mind and accommodate while you're running the game. And so here it was, like, like I said, like one or two or three of my players were happy with the idea of running a domain. And if you decided to do that, you would roll on a chart to see what bloodline you were. And you got like, which of the heroes at this famous battle, the Mount, Battle of Mount Deusmar, which I liked. I remember because it sounded like, uh, like Deus Ex, meaning God, right? So um, you get... It's the battle where these mortals became gods because I think they killed the god. And if you're, there's like six or seven heroes that were at this battle. They became 
you know, they ascended into godhood. And if you're descended from one of those guys, then you have this bloodline that makes you better than a normal, normal person, gives you special abilities. And they're basically feats. This is sort of where feats came from. This is the first time we saw it's not um, a class ability. It's not a, a, a secondary skill, which is what they used to call skills. Uh, there, was no, there wasn't skills and secondary skills. There was just secondary skills, and that's the, what you got. Uh, and back then, you didn't really have feats, but you started to get these, oh, my character has like dark vision, right? And that came from my bloodline. And so this is the beginning of adding more character options to the game. So I'm not going to read this whole thing because that would be tedious. But when you bust this thing open, you get this cool, the like ethnicities, the peoples. I got to make sure that you got you folks can see this. And it's actually not a good way to do it without there being, um, and of course I'm, I'm, I'm hovering over chat here without showing you. So it's, you can see that there is this, here, there's, a, there's a world, which... Uh, Trivia is called Abrinus, I believe, A-B-R-Y-N-E-S or something like that. And all these different people have invaded this place and conquered it. And so you're looking at the history of the setting uh, and where these people came from. And so there's uh, one, two, three, four, five distinct um, ethnicities within this area, within this continent. And they each represent a kind of a fantasy take on some real world place. Like uh, there's the Jurek, who are like uh, the Norse. And then uh, we'll go through, there are other things. And there's the Anwirians, and the Anwirians are like Europeans. Uh, and the Bre or they're more like, I would say, like England, English. And then the Brechtur, who are more like uh, Venetians, not people from Venus, people from Venice. And the Vos, who are like uh, Russians. And the Kanasi, who are like uh, Moors, I think. And then you get their dwarves and their elf. There are no gnomes. There are no gnomes. Yay! Well, there were probably gnomes in here somewhere. That's one of the things about this campaign setting, about Birthright, is that it was this dude's um, world that he built, I think, for a novel, novels that he wanted to write. And, um, and he pitched it to TSR and they bought it. And then they kind of had to shoehorn in all the stuff from D&D. So you can tell when you go through this that there's not, um, some things in here kind of stick out because they weren't meant for the setting. Somebody asked, what is my favorite bloodline benefits? I do not remember. It's been 20 years since I played this, I apologize. But I don't remember any of the bloodline benefits being super good. And I never played in Birthright. Uh, you have to ask one of my players. Let's see. Uh, and then when you open up further, you get um, this thing, which I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna show on the stream for too long because I got one of them. If you type in, ready for this? Yeah, we did use we did use players options, Bishop. There was a series of books uh, for second edition called the Players Option series. The Players Option series were basically them experimenting with all the stuff that would eventually become third edition. And uh, we did use it when we played Birthright. So if you type in exclamation point map, you're gonna get a link. There we go, Mubot took care of it. And it's a high res map of uh of the continent of Cerulea where the game is set and so it's a classic medieval European setting where you've got peoples invading Europe from all over the place and mixing together I think most campaigns took place in uh is it Anwir I think it is so this is the box by the way and uh it's not a not an incredibly popular setting it came out at a time when TSR was making lots of settings, uh, on, there was a whole uh, category of person who would, who they were, they were, uh, we should come up with a name for them. They loved lore. So that's, this is the, this, you pick this up at a game store. You just walked into a game store and there was this thing and I opened it up and I really liked it. Why? Because I like that kind of play. When I was uh, first playing D&D &D in my friend Brad's campaign, uh, I became a landed noble and I really liked that fantasy. I had been serving the, the, the Lord of Greyhawk and he awarded me a bunch of land and that there wasn't really, Brad I don't think had any rules for that kind of stuff, but I loved that style of play. My other players liked it a lot. They were sort of jealous of me. So like my friend Dave just pointed to a point on the map and said, who lives here? And Brad, this is the Greyhawk map. Brad said, oh, a bunch of barbarians. He goes, I'm gonna go there, take it over. And uh, so that was that notion, he became Baron Kale. So I love that notion of nation building and countries, you know, waging war against each other and spying and stuff like that. And Forgotten Realms had come out and I bought the Forgotten Realms box set and I quite liked it, that first box set, which was basically, I think, Cormier and the, is it the Sword Coast? And it was really cool. The problem I had with that, and I mentioned this before, is that when I looked at it, I couldn't tell what was going on. I'm like, who's, who, what is this area? 
right? Like, is this, um, is it, 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 like, even if you were looking at the Greek city states, for instance, uh, they, each of those city states projected its power in an area and protected all these little cities around it. Right, and there's a whole bunch of you, a whole bunch of Donald Kagan lectures talking about the the alliances between those city states and their outlying regions. So you, you still had this notion that Athens governed this area, right, uh, and or Madeira did uh, govern this area and stuff like that. And there was no, there was in the Forgotten Realms, there's nothing like that, and it annoyed the hell out of me. And it seemed kind of um, obviously done by a dude who didn't care about that stuff. That wasn't a thing that was important to him, like na national borders and stuff like that. Didn't matter to him. So when I saw when I when I saw Birthright and I saw that map, I was like, "Look, there's borders on the map, and there's lots of little countries." And it seemed really well thought out, right? How do borders? How are borders created? Well, they tend to go along rivers and stuff like that, or the border of the forest and stuff like that. So I thought, "Wow, this is really cool." And so I bought the box set when it came out, and it comes with a bunch of stuff. And I, it's my considered opinion that the 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 reason you buy a campaign setting is because it saves you a lot of work. It would have taken me literally years to write all this stuff. The reason I ran Birthright was because I fell in love with it. And that's how it should be for you. Don't run a setting because other people tell you to. Don't run Forgotten Realms because it's the default setting. Run a setting because you look into it and you just love it. I think that's what everybody wants. People just want to fall in love. Give them that opportunity and you'll be successful. So this is, let's see, what? You get three rule books in the Birthright box set. One, two, three. And they're all soft cover. I would love to do a box set someday, but I think a box set needs something called the rattle factor, right? Where you uh, go, ooh, what's in here, right? So it needs to have minis inside it, I think. People tend to put just dice in there. You can get dice anywhere. Uh, the, there's a, the, the Atlas of Cerulea, which is basically just that map, but explained. Um, yeah, and it talks, about, it talks about the whole thing. But, uh, the, so this is the planet, not the planet. This is the continent. It's an overview of the continent. It's really thin. It even shows you, I love this. Does Forgotten Realms have this? I don't think so. Does any other campaign setting have this? I don't know if you can see this, but this is a map of the different invasions of this continent and where the different people came from. So yeah, how many settings are there out there that that show you the, the eras of invasion? This is, uh, if you want Matt Colville to fall in love with you, you need, you need one of these. A, map, a history of your invasions. Quote board. Um, the, uh, so this, I love this, you know, it just, it helps you understand the, you know, where did these people that live on this continent come from and how long have they been there? And uh, it also gives you an idea of how, how recent were the most recent uh, wars and stuff like that. Uh, let's see. I, I, I smooched her. Uh, so yeah, I love that stuff. This book, very, very short because it just is covering the in a very high detail it covers all the different regions of this continent and those they're they're too big unless you're a very, unless it's a high level campaign you're not going to visit all those regions you got to pick one and so they put out a source book for each of these regions right they put out a source book for the uh, northern european setting they put out a source book for the moorish setting the russian setting the uh, venice florentine is another way of looking at it and this is one of those uh, this is the one that comes with the book it's called ruins of empire it should have been called the Atlas of Anuir. One of the things I loved about Birthright and still do is that I it, it had its own kind of uh, language. You could it has its own logic. Uh, it's very um, like sort of quasi Gaelic, I think. This is the ruins of Empire book. The the area that covers the kind of uh, south <clears throat> southwest of Cerulea, and this is where you learn about all the different countries that are in this place. And the history of it. One of the things that they did, well, we'll get into this. Um, it lists all the kingdoms in here, all the domains, and it breaks them down into areas. Here's the southern coast and the places that are in there. So each, if you look at the map, like for instance, exclamation point map, you can look at the map and you can zoom in on the map to this area, the southern coast. We can all do it together. We can all follow along at home, children. So if you look on the copy of your map that you're looking at in your web browser, exclamation point map, uh, you see there's, uh, the, one of the things you could tell, wow, Matt really loves the setting, is I just got how to pronounce all the names. I just got it. it even though my players would often, they it, it, it's always seemed like it was a chore for them to decipher the ways you put vowels together. It always made perfect sense to me. So here's this area. This is Diomed. Diomed 
uh, Midor, 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 I don't remember how to, how to pronounce that one. Ilian, Rozone, and Arenwi. Uh, so I, I was, you know, there was a province in here in Tuornan. There was a province, you can sort of see it, called Eleves Nemier. No one in my game besides me could pronounce that. It, they would drop syllables. I'm like, how did you miss a whole syllable? Eleves Nemier. Uh, and I, so I loved the pronunciation of it. It was, it felt different to the language that I would have been using, but it also had this kind of romantic quality to it that I really liked. You will notice that each of these countries, domains, uh, is broken up and you can see where the different provinces are. And I believe if you had a hex overlay, you would discover that they follow, that was originally a hex map. There isn't a hex map anywhere included in here, but I believe his original map was a hex map. So you'll notice that you can see the provinces. So for instance, in Diomed, um, in fact, it's funny that I can't remember how to pronounce, I think it's Meteor. I think, no, it can't be. It's, it's Metore. Metore? I think it's Metore. Um, it's funny because my ex-girlfriend ran that place and did a really good job of it too. Um, but if you look at Diomed, you can see there's different provinces. There's, um, there's the capital city, which is in uh, Moray, and then there's Tier and Duene, I think, I'm not sure. And each of those has a number underneath it. It'll say two slash three or five slash zero. And those are um, like how, so five slash zero, I believe, means um, there's five resource, five units worth of resources available here of which zero are currently being exploited, I think. So yeah, are there anyone, are there any, I think you'll, we, we can test this hypothesis by looking to see if there are any of these fractions, any of these ratios where the, uh, the denominator is higher than the numerator. And uh, it is, there isn't, it's always, the left number is always higher than the right. So that means like, if you look at um, Bellum in Rozone, it's three slash two, meaning you're getting two resources out of this three resource place. There's one resource left to get. Um, with a civilization level and the max possible resource level. Okay, well, that's close to what I'm talking about. So we have this uh, cool uh, list of a big book of all, here's Tornan, one of my, the, the main character in my game. This was the domain he ran. So you can see here, the Tornan, in this country, there's a chart. And the chart over on one side is a list of provinces. And uh, the, it shows the provinces slash holdings. There are eight of them. And then, it's got uh, columns, and the columns are law, temples, law, temples, guilds, law, temples, guilds, and sources. This is a second edition D&D &D product, and they kind of revised the game from first edition to second edition, and the major re revision is just, um, it's just organization. They just started organizing things differently. So it used to be there were lots of different classes, and then in second edition, there were only four classes. There was the fighter, a wizard, a cleric, and a rogue. That's when we got rogue for the first time. And then a paladin was a subtype of fighter. A ranger was, a, I think, also a subtype of fighter. And then a rogue was one kind of thief, et cetera, et cetera. So you get this, uh, you get this four, you see the four columns. Remember, four characters in second edition. Fighter, fighter, cleric, rogue, wizard. And there are four columns. Law, temples, guilds, and sources. Also, did you notice there are four, four different types of, of keeps, four different types of strongholds in the stronghold book? So what this shows you, and this is one of the things I loved about it, but I think this may have been a mistake design-wise. So you can see that there's each, each province in your domain. So your domain has different provinces. I would call them like hexes, but provinces is a good word. Different hexes, different provinces. And each province has f four, has the, has the potential of having four different uh, sources of power inside it, law, temples, guilds, and sources representing fighters, clerics, thieves, and wizards. And there could be several churches, for instance, this is one of the things I really liked about Birthright, is it had one of the most, what I would, what I would deem, realistic approaches to churches in Dungeons and Dragons. Because in the real world, there are many different churches to in one religion, many different branches, and they sort of compete with each other. So they would say, okay, of the four churches in this area, which one is in charge? And that one kind of is gets the benefit of these resources. And it was this interesting little very sieve-like game, which um, was useful to us as dungeon masters because it told us who was in charge, who were the, what were the rivalries in my own domain what you know this th this church is in charge but this church is the second best and they would like to be the best and so that makes it really easy for me to come up with conflicts and that's our job as a dungeon master it's our if our number one job is 
is, uh, you know, verisimilitude and tricking the players into believing in the reality of the secondary world, which, by the way, is also the job of the author, the writer. Our second job is creating drama, which is the also the job of the writer. So dungeon masters and writers are very close cousins. Uh, so, but the problem is that there's all sorts of crazy rules. There's all these stats for this chart, right? And it's not a computer game. So we never used, we never did all that stuff. There's all you would have to make spreadsheets of all the different countries in the area and all their provinces and all the different sources of law and chaos and still law and chaos of temples and guilds and stuff like in there. And I don't think anybody ever did that. I don't think anybody ever ran birthright the way the designer sort of imagined. And it sort of makes me wonder whether or not that was something imposed on them by the people producing it, saying, "Well, we have to have this, that, or the other thing." Um, so there's a whole bunch of different uh, stuff here. In the, that's how they would break stuff down. They would, here's a list of all the countries in this area. So here's uh, two pages on Tuwarnan and tells you what's going on in this country. And then you turn the page. And here's a page on Alamier. And here's a page on the imperial city of Anwir, which is a city-state all by itself, which I like. I actually, I actually pitched when I was, um, I guess I probably went in 26 or 27, right before I got my first job in games at Last Unicorn Games. Uh, I pitched a box set. I said, I will write and produce a box set for the Imperial City of Anwir because I had been running a game in it for a while and I had invented a whole bunch of stuff and I felt like I had a really good handle on what made this setting great and they said, thanks, but no thanks. Oh, Endier. Here's get one page on Endier. It's a relatively small province and it's, got, it's, a, it's a country that only has one province, right? Look at, you can see there's a chart. I don't know if you, yeah, you can see. There's a chart. It only has one, well, only has one row. So there's a, there's a, uh, I think it's a county. It's a count, the guy in charge here. And it tells you who the regent is, Gilder Kalian. And it tells you who his lieutenant is. This is something that I think is useful. Who is your second command? Who's the person that isn't, who runs your place while you're gone? Stay tuned. And uh, the thing, my, my, I gave Endier to my friend Brad. Brad was the thief king of Endier. And he did a great job because the idea of this, of Endier is that it's, since it's tiny, it has to use politics to keep itself alive and pit this country against that country and this country against that country. My friend Brad did a great job with that. Um, so I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure that uh, people ran this using all these stats and all these numbers and all these rules. I think mostly we just, uh, so this is great because here we have, so we just listed things in charge, in, in, in terms of who's in charge in that, who runs, who runs this place. But in this place, there are many churches. So I might be the, I might be the uh, Duke of Tuornan, like my friend Dave was, and I have these provinces and I'm in charge here, but each of these provinces have guilds in them, and the guilds have power, and they have churches in them, and the churches have power. And because I'm a fighter, I'm mostly concerned with the uh, the law domains in here. But now we have a list of all of the churches. There's the Western Imperial Temple of Halen, right? And all of the different, it's, it's the same data we just saw, but refactored based on all the churches, all the guilds. So that's pretty useful. And then we go on, this is all just a whole bunch of big atlas, Here's uh, Thozone. I believe the DH is pronounced like a TH. And we don't need to go over this whole thing, but there's one of these, and we'll look at a couple of them. There's one of these for each of the regions. Sorry, I got so annoying. I'll get used to it eventually. And probably another three or four streams, I will get used to holding stuff here. Um, there's, there's a book for each of the different regions. In, so there's a ton of information, a ton of information in Birthright. Here's the rule book. Did I do it right? Hey, I did it right the first time. Look at that. Uh... And it tells you, hey, here's how elves work. Here's how halflings work. Are there gnomes in here? I don't. I bet there aren't. Because this is a civilized campaign setting. Uh, humans. Nope. <laughs> and it talks about like uh, all the different character classes and how they work here. It gives you a list of the bloodlines, and you would roll on this chart, and you would see which bloodline am I descended from, and then their bloodline abilities. So let's let's uh, take a look here. Um, Okay, this is going to be really familiar to those of you who have been playing D&D &D for a while. But you roll on a chart, and the chart is bloodline, blood ability acquisition, right? And this is what, how strong a bloodline do I have? How closely related am I to those people that fought in that battle? And so once you figure out, like, you can have a bloodline and not gain an ability. And then there are minor abilities and major abilities. And the list of abilities is right here. And this is the first time, I believe, I believe, this is the first time in D&D &D we'd ever seen anything like, like this. What's the first ability, what's the first bloodline ability I could get, depending on how I roll, depending on who I'm descended from? Alertness. Right? 
Alertness is still in the game. We still have it. This is where it comes from. It's, uh, you possess an uncanny sense of your surroundings and you are surprised only on a roll of one. This actually bugs me because it says the character possesses an uncanny sense of his surroundings. Come on. You know how English works. You can say they. They is a perfectly reasonable third person, uh, singular. Uh, the character possesses an uncanny sense of their surroundings and is surprised only on a roll of one. Right? Uh, the uh, alter appearance, battle wise. Somebody asked if I had a favorite one of these. I don't remember. Divine Aura, Divine Wrath. Enhanced sense, elemental control. So these were these crazy abilities you had that weren't class abilities and they weren't skills. What were they? They were bloodline abilities. They became feats. Uh, so that's cool. Blood theft. You could steal someone. So so the idea here, this kind of gets to that uh, antiquated notion that the, the, the ruler is better than the people, right? And that's an actual real thing that people in the real world believed. There was a time when some people thought that the kings and their their ilk the, were just like a, a, a better species of human than, than, than the peasants. And there was some ineffable quality that separated them from us, that they weren't just normal people like us whose ancestors had fought and killed their way to the top, that they were, they were literally different. They were physically different in some way. Well, this campaign setting imagines that that is literally true. And that the, the rulers have a bloodline ability. That it's, it makes them, it gives them a supernatural quality, right? Remember that list of abilities? Those are all like supernatural abilities. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could steal someone's bloodline. You could steal that ability if you killed them with a weapon made, what was the actual name of the, uh, a weapon called blood silver, a blood silver weapon, but the name of it was Timaveril. And this is one of those things, I remember Remember, I told you I loved this because I just, I looked at that and I got how to pronounce it. There's a pronunciation guide and I loved it. So if you had a Timaveril weapon and you killed a regent, you stole your Highlander, basically, you stole their bloodline. Yeah, yes, Mr. Red Sky. When two scions meet in battle and one dies, special circumstance may allow the slayer to gain part of the victim's bloodline power. Blood theft. Yep. Excuse me. So here we talk about domains and it gets down to provinces and how that works and what those numbers mean. Um, how this is what that uh, per person in chat correctly identified is that the number of a, the first number of provinces, how developed it is. A level zero province is wild or unsettled. A level five province is a level seven province are greater, densely settled. And then how many holdings it has in it. Provinces are also described by their establishments within them. Four types of holdings exist. Remember, one for each class. Uh, and then, let's see. Uh, a province, so that your, how uh, the province with a four civilization rating can accommodate up to four slots of holdings, four, which means four slot, you can have four slots of law holdings, four slots of temples. It gets kind of crazy. It makes perfect sense. This is true of a lot of D&D, &D, by the way. This is true of third edition, a lot of second edition. As you're reading it, you're like, wow, this is very sensible. This is very logical. And there are four classes, so there are four types of holdings. But then when you actually try to run it, you start to realize it's a pain in the butt. There's just too much going on. That's one of the things I like about fifth edition is it does not work that way. And you will see that in, which you haven't already, My uh, there is a rough draft of the basic rules of my warfare stuff. I've used it a couple times. And every time I do a warfare system for D&D, &D, I'm adapting it to, I'm adapting something I already have to the current edition. And fifth edition is very kind of simple and straightforward and things work the way you would expect. It doesn't, uh, th it doesn't go, it doesn't go deep, deep, deep into systems and systems nested within systems like this does. So uh, there are rules for here for how do you become, how do you become a regent, right? Um, the birthright game I ran, this will give you a, um, did that work? Johnny Flash? I didn't, I don't think it did. Um, the, the birthright game I ran, and this will give you, I, I, I think Matt Mercer did a little bit of this. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure he didn't get the idea from me. People often say, oh, I wonder, I saw this happen in Matt Mercer's game. Did he get that idea from you? You need to trust me on this. Matt has a, a more than one person's worth of his own cool ideas. Um, I ran, so what I did was I talked to my players about which of them wanted to be regents. And uh, three of them said, three or four of them said yes. And so what I did was I would get together with each of them individually and I played D&D &D just me and my friend Dave for like, and from first to third level, and just me and my friend Craig from first to third level independently of each other. And we were, we were friends and we saw each other all the time and we did, we played lots of games and we'd go to the arcade and, and go to golf and stuff and stuff like that. And so this was something happening kind of in the background of all that. 
And my friend Dave inherits the throne of Tawarnan. He's the son of the Duke. The Duke dies. He's in the Imperial City going to school at university. And he has to come home and he has to kind of take over and start running the shop. And so he starts meeting NPCs and he has to organize his, his new domain and his, some, of his follow, some of his father's men leave and he has to replace them. I need, I, need, I need a wizard. I need a court wizard. I need this, that, and the other thing. And so he starts talking to people, people he met in the city, people he heard about, famous people, and starts sending them messages and getting replies and nine out of ten of those of these uh, and, and you know he is, he's in conflict with some of these characters and some of them are potential allies and neighbors and stuff like that and so there's a lot of we're playing D&D and we're adventuring and he's going through his he's going through you know his, his people his his lieutenant comes to him and says the the mayor of this city is saying that there's a problem there's a you know uh, goblins have have kidnapped the blacksmith's daughter and now the lord of the realm is like I'll take care of it right except not that because that obviously there's a disparity between so yeah we got to come up with cooler stuff to do but that's the idea you're still an adventurer you can still go on adventures running a domain does not mean you're not an adventurer that's ridiculous D&D is still there's still one whole third of the game is a monster book what kind of game is it a game about killing monsters so you still go out and you kill monsters and you get treasure and stuff like that but there's just this layer on top of that of this political dimension where you're thinking about your campaign you're thinking about your domain and how it works and what's going on in it and so first to the third level it was him putting out fires and doing little kind of D&D style adventuring in his own domain and making allies and talking to them and all these missives he would send off he'd get replies and what he discovered was later when we got together the, the wizard that he said, hey, I've got this untapped source of magic here in my world. Mavail, I think is what it was called. Uh, I've got this untapped source of Mavail, and I don't have a court wizard. Maybe we could work something out. This, this guy was like, sure, I'll come check it out and set up shop. And when we got together to play, it was our friend John. John and Dave had no idea that this NPC he'd been communicating with for weeks was one of the players. I didn't tell them that. I didn't tell them we were going to do that. I told Dave, we're going to get together and play, because you're going to be this character... So before we get together and everyone else makes characters, you're going to make your character, you'll have your history, you're going to role play your backstory. And, and he didn't realize that the other players are doing the same thing, and neither did they, because I didn't tell them that. So when we all got together and they became a team for the first time, there was this incredibly, probably maybe even impossible to duplicate uh, moment where they were like, holy crap, I, I, you're the guy that did this, that, and the other thing. I've been talking to you because I, anytime Dave would send off a letter, I'd say, okay, well, I'm going to go home and next time we get together, I'll have answers for these things. And he assumed I was going home and I was writing up the answers, and I usually was, but occasionally I was just saying, hey, John, this guy sends you a message. So we talked about bloodlines. We talked about uh, how they are kind of the birth of feats. We talked about um, how you can, how you run, a, how, what a domain is. And then there are domain actions. You got a whole, I'm getting used to it, yeah. There's a whole list of things you can do in a season. And Birthright didn't invent a lot of this stuff. The idea of using a season as the unit for any. A lot of these things go all the way back to the first uh, role-playing game, the Braunsteins, which were uh, war games, regular everyday war games, tabletop war games, that were um, where you could you could you could spy on your neighbor, or that meant infiltrating a city before the before the before the war game started. That's where the birth of RPGs comes out of that tradition. And in war games. You have things like this in war games. It, war games tend to measure a campaign in seasons because that's how armies fought. So there are a list of things you can do during a um, domain action, which is the a an action that your nation takes. And I don't know any. I, I use these things kind of, sort of, right. Um, it was really easy to run a, a birthright campaign and just use the setting and not use any of these rules. So there, here's rules for how to fight battles, which. I, 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 not only did I not use, I didn't know, I don't know anybody that used, right? And you can see there's a little map. I'm sure people did do it because people did anything you can think of, people did. Um, it is the internet after all. But uh, and here you can see there's like a map of, um, uh, there's like front ranks and rear ranks. And it's basically like battle lore, if you remember battle lore, very similar to that. So it's got, you know, a whole system in here for waging war. And you're going to see some more of that in a second. Um, here's the list of uh, gods. One of the things, one of the probably the most common questions I get that I don't have an answer for really is how do I make a pantheon? You make up a bunch of gods. The way I do it is I try to contextualize the mores, it's a sociological term, go look it up, the mores of the culture and turn those things into gods. And that is, I think, pretty effective actually. So uh, maybe we'll do that in a future stream. So here are all the different churches and then there's realm spells. You're going to see some of that in our system because, uh, you know, it's super cool. And here we go. This is great. The mon monsters in Birthright, and look at that word. Let's see if we can, yeah, you can see that word, right? Let's see if we can, if I get, if I, actually, I think, I think it will zoom in. 
There we go. What is that word? How do you pronounce that? Kaffergeschlagen. The birthright battle system is in no way similar to mine, the one real G. No, 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 no. Mine is usable. Um, so it's pronounced on Shalin, that word. Let's do it again. Let's take a look at the word. This is pronounced on Shalin. And uh, the on Shalin are monsters with bloodline, if I remember correctly. And it was cool. They did this really neat thing where they um, they took some of the monsters from the monster manual, um, like the Gorgon and um, the Medusa, two, di two different things in this case, and said, these are not a category of monsters. These are a unique named monster. And they each had their own realm. So there was the Medusa. This is the only one. There was the Gorgon, which is this big uh, bullheaded thing. It's cool that the Anshalin are these unique monsters that take a, 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 the equivalent, this is an example, of imagine if there weren't Mind Flayers. Imagine if there was the Mind Flayer, right? Actually, isn't that a episode? It is. It's the title of a Stranger Things episode. And when that red text faded up, the Mind Flayer, I was like, wow, I didn't make the connection to Birthright, but I'm like, there is something cool about taking this thing that I know as a category of creature and turning it into a singular entity. This is not a mind flare. This is the mind flare, the one who flays minds. I'm like, wow, that is cool. That's the that's the rule book. It tells you how to run. Tells you how to run domains. Tells you how to read a domain, how to take actions. How does your how does your country, how does your county take actions? What do they do? Uh, how do you fight wars? And so then you start going into the meat of the box set. So those are the three. You get an atlas of the whole world. You get a zoomed in country by country. What are the different nations in this realm? And then you get a rule book that tells you how bloodlines work, that tells you uh, what all the different bloodline abilities are, basically feats. How, what are the rules for running a domain, right? What are the stats? Of, what are those, what's a domain's character sheet look like? And then how do you wage war using the battle system? And when you open, when you continue going through the box set, you, you discover all this uh, uh, stuff. I almost said nonsense, and I almost said awesome stuff. Like, look, once again, look at this. These are unit cards. And actually, I do use something similar to this. Uh, but they use unit cards on a grid with ranks and files and facings and maneuvers, which means if you're running a battle in Birthright, you're not, you're, running a battle in Birthright is its own game, separate from an encounter. And I am philosophically opposed to that. I think that a battle, a battle in my system, and philosophically, I think a, a, a battle is a type of encounter. So an encounter is when we have initiative and we start swinging our swords and it, it, there's a combat uh, and there's um, and there's battle. And a battle is like an overlay. So this war, you can watch the, we did one. Uh, we, we live streamed it. It's on YouTube somewhere. We live streamed the Battle of Castle Rend and there were units and it went, it went pretty well actually. It went pretty much the way I would expect it to go. So the system is working and other people have used the system and reported back that it basically works. Uh, it'll take a lot of tweaking, a lot of playtesting, but that'll be for the warfare system. But the basic stuff works. And so you've got, in Birthright, the assumption is that there are rules for movement, there are rules for positioning and flanking and stuff like that, but I simplify all that in my system and I make like flanking just a maneuver. You make a check and if you if you succeed in that in that command check, then you get, you are you are flanking and you get to do this cool thing and there's no actual positioning or anything like that because it, my system, it all happens simultaneous with the actual fighting of monsters. But Birthright, assumed that it said it's a tactical war game. It sold itself, you saw the conspectus, right? It sold itself as a tactical war game. Um, I don't know that anybody, like I got this off eBay and whoever this person was never even punched these out. Telling. Then you get these cards and these cards are great. This is the cards are really what I think make this box set um, desirable. So here's a, uh, a, a creature card, the spider. This is one of the on Shalin. It's got AD and D stats and history and what it's about. There's a bunch of these in here for the different monsters. Uh, here is an example of a domain records sheet. Here's Rozon. And here's the map of Rozon, which is quite nice. And you can see there are different provinces. And there's a key to it. Let's see, we can zoom in a little bit here. Focus your, oh, there we go, yeah. And then here is its character sheet. Domain record sheet. It's kind of dark, I realize, I apologize. I can get a little bit closer, probably. Is this live? Fakurdo asks, no, this is not live. 
Obviously, it's not live. Don't be ridiculous. So this is, sorry, I'm, I'm, my arm is twisted and contorted. So this shows you like, oh, there, look, there's a list of the different provinces and the, oh, what were the holdings in that province? And, you know, how much do domain power does it have? Um, actually, this, uh, Rosone, I think, um, no, it was, is Rosone the country that uh, my girlfriend ran? I think it is. Uh, the Black Baron. And here is how uh, you get a whole card showing you how does a domain turn work? How does, what is, if running a nation, if running your country is a game with turns, what are the things you can do on your turn? There's a master list of actions. And I think a turn breaks down to a season. Again, that's because of classic wargaming. Are there concessions for players who use D&D &D as an outlet for evil? I, 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 I think I know what you mean, clockwork. Uh, hey, clockwork. Hey, you know, the clockwork did a fantastic, if I remember correctly, did a fantastic uh, map of Calabras. I have players who are moving towards taking over a duchy, but they are the type to roll into town in a desecrated temple. There, there's nothing in Birthright that says you have to be a good ruler. My friend Brad w w was a party member and ran Endier, the thief king of Endier, and he was not a good guy. <laughs> they knew that. He was, you know, he was with the party because they had uh, similar goals. His court wizard had been kidnapped, and Dave's court wizard, or uh, somebody had, important had been kidnapped. And so they joined forces, but they all knew Brad. It's funny thing was they all knew the thief king of Endier could betray them if the if it happened. And this is funny because, but it turned out that my friend Craig, my friend Craig started by running a character called um, Darkad Creol, who was a half brass dragon bard. He was basically dragonborn before dragonborn. He was a half half dragon, half dragon, half dwarf. Great character, and ran this. He was because his this is his idea. And uh, between he and I, we came up with this cool backstory where uh, his the dwarves delved into this dragon's lair and uh, in, and and fought the dragon very kind of um, um, what's that uh, game that's impossible to play? I almost said Dwarven Forge, but that's not it. Dwarf Fortress, woo! Uh, very Dwarf Fortress esque battle against this dragon, and then finally they made peace with the dragon and made a pact with the dragon and the leader of the dwarves, and the dragon turned into a dwarf, and they as often primitive peoples did they would seal this pact by with a union and now there's a line of half dragon dwarves and every once in a while that line breeds true and you get like not a dwarf but an actual half dragon and that was my friend craig and he was a bard and he was the leader of the dwarven he was the leader of um this place we're gonna get into this in a second he, this was a dwarven realm he was the leader of that dwarven realm and uh he retired that character actually what we did was we were going through Night Below and we had the kind of classic problem in Night Below of we're going to spend an entire adventure in the Underdark. Is that, is that a good idea? Note that the actual official 5th edition adventure that is all Underdark begins with the characters prisoners in the Underdark. Why do they do that? I don't know. I don't get a chance to talk to those guys and ask them, but I'm going to guess it's because they realize that the problem with an Underdark adventure, a big epic Underdark adventure, is the players are always like, but I'm from up here and this is where everything I care about is... I would like to go back there. And it's not fun to run an adventure where the players are always like, when are we going to be done down here so we can go back to the thing we care about? So this was my solution for that. Uh, it's happened almost every time I've run Night Below, so that's a problem that I need to solve. But uh, the notion that we're going to take these characters and run a second can to keep to stop doing Night Below and make new characters for Night Below. And that worked. That worked very well because the new characters for Night Below, my friend Craig's character was the the lord of the he was one of the nine lords of the college of sorcery he was the alienist he was in charge of he had solid uh black eyes and he had this alien glyph uh, carved into his head that identified him to demons and devils and other extra planet creatures as as something not to be trifled with and he was the head of the college of uh conjuration and summoning right and that was his title the alienist because he dealt with these alien things and the well, some powerful wizard had been kidnapped and he had to go into the underdark to save that person and his right hand man have i told the story before i bet i have his but many of you probably haven't heard it his right hand my friend mark said hey could i play like his bodyguard like if he is somebody who is summoning if his thing is i'm the guy in charge of summoning alien creatures into this plane and constraining them and controlling them mark said well by definition doesn't that go wrong every once in a while and and sometimes these things are immune to magic so you need a fighter you need a highly specialized fighter to take care of those things. And they were like, yeah, that was a cool idea. So they became kind of like, um, you know, uh, 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 the two guys from the short stories that uh, Steven Erickson, somebody in chat is going to get this. I love those books, by the way. Somebody that the Brokelin and Corbel, Bro I don't know, Corbel, I don't know, Bokelin, Botulin, Botulin, and Botulism. I don't remember. These two guys, Fawford and the Grey Mouser, basically. But except a wizard and this fighter team, friends. Friends for a long time, allies. And then my friend uh, Mark was like, off to the side, he's like, I would like to do something a little bit different. And 
and have some cool thing to my character, maybe some secret that the other players don't know about. But I don't know what that would be. And I was like, well, what if you're a spy for the Thieves Guild? And he's like, what? I said, what if you're a long-term sleeper agent and you're a mole that was planted years ago? And he's like, that's cool. Could I be that guy? I'm like, yeah, obviously the Thieves Guild wants to know what's going on in the Royal College of Sorcery, and they don't have a high-level wizard that they can, you know, get promoted in there, so they use you. And he's like, yeah, I'm down. And so he played this, his, the, the wizard's right-hand man was a loyal, when you're not, all, you're, all you are is a long-term sleeper agent, just report back. That's all your job is. You never gonna have to. Be, you never have to do anything treacherous or anything like that. All you're doing is giving us notes so we know what's going on. Information is an incredibly important thing in a political game. It is its own currency. And so there was a dude sent down to, um, to I think, to rescue this wizard. And Craig's like, I'm gonna go with you. And Mark was told by the thieves guild, if this other PC fails to kill this guy, it's your job to do it. And he's like, okay. And this PC died over the course of the adventure. And Mark, we played for three years, remember? Three years, Mark had this secret in his pocket every week. And somewhere around year two, the PC who's, I'm going down here to find to find this wizard, find and kill this wizard, this evil wizard or something, that Craig is trying to rescue. I don't remember the exact politics of it. But that character died. And now Mark is like, crap, crap, heck, heck, now I have to do it. And in fact... That's exactly what happened is when they got down there and they finally found these imprisoned wizards, Mark uh, killed the person that Craig was there to save. And then the two of these characters ended up fighting. They ended up like Craig opened a portal to escape after he lost the battle and Mark's character jumped into it. And now these characters often appear in my games fighting their way through the multiverse. And they still, Craig still bears a tiny grudge against Mark for that. And, uh, and in that battle, in that final battle, my friend Dave, Brad, who was running the Thief King of Endier, he, he was down there to get his court wizard. He saw his court wizard, saw what was happening with the party. He was like, eh, grabbed his court wizard, threw him over his shoulder and teleported out. And everyone's like, oh, I did it. <laughs> but we need, it was a huge battle and we need you. And he's like, yeah, but I got what I came for. See you. Right? So was that an evil act? Uh, all he did was abandon the party in their moment of need. He didn't kill anybody. He didn't stab anybody in the back. So this all comes from that question about running an evil game. It's not black and white. There's a spectrum. So I don't know what you guys think about that story. Hopefully it wasn't boring. Here's the whole card on how to, how to speak this language. It's a pronunciation guide, I believe. I just hit myself in the head with it. Um... Which, is, which was really useful, and I grokked it immediately. Loved it. Fell in love with Birthright. If you're going to run a setting, don't run one because it's popular. Run it because you fell in love with it. Do some research online and see. And there's actually a, a, a font in here. There's actually a little, you can see a little bit of what the script looks like. So it's a great print, a list of names. Super useful. I find. Uh, here's a blank domain record sheet. Bunch of cards in here. Um, here is one of my favorites. Right? Ready for this dude? Look at that guy. This is the Lord of the Elves. And this dude hates humans. Game Guy 45, 4 on 15, you were correct. You're either getting busy walking or you're getting busy dying. This guy's name is Ro... <gasps> this guy's name is Rove Manslayer. I'll say it while the word is up so you get how to pronounce it. It's pronounced Rove Manslayer. And he is in charge of the Gilly Seed. He's in charge of the Hunt of the Elves. Where, and in fact, I believe my friend Dave's uh, domain, Tornin, is right next to this guy's land. And he is one of the villains of our piece. And so it's his guys that get killed by the elves when they go riding on their kind of, uh, 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 their centaurs or whatever. Um, he's, yeah, he's one of the bad guys. And in fact, you want to see something cool? Answer? Yes, you do. Um, where is it? Don't let me know. What did I do with it? Stand by. No, don't, no, don't nobody go nowhere. Uh, here we go. I don't know what, what, what product this is from, by the way. But um, this is a map of a tower. Right? And this is the Tower of Ruinok. And Ruinok is... Uh, I don't know why he hates humans, actually. I probably something bad in this past happened. This is the Tower of Rove Manslayer. And uh, I'm gonna have to back. I'm gonna back the f up to show you this. Back it, just back it up. Just back it up. Back it up. Just back it up. Just back it up. Look at that! Woo! That is cool. You want it, don't you? Yeah. You're like, I want to run this game, and I want to run this thing. And I want the players to have to go through and fight this guy. So you know, if you're gonna, hello. If you're gonna stab up a bad guy. That means the player is going to want to go fight him. And that means he needs a lair. And this is a lair. I actually have no idea what product this is from. But uh, this is Rove Manslayer's uh, 
uh, his, his villainous hideout. Pretty cool, right? Here is the Gorgon. Right? Look at that guy. He's another, he's not, there's not a Gorgon, there's only one, it's this guy. And he is, uh, Rogue Manslayer is kind of, I would say, neutral evil. This guy is legit um, lawful, this guy is lawful evil. And he, I think, probably more than Rogue Manslayer, he is the villain of the campaign. I think uh, Rogue Manslayer is kind of the skulky one in the background. This is, I think, is this the beginning? Is this where Orogs came from? I don't think it is. But this, they get a lot, they are much more, this, Orogs were the orcs of Birthright. So... There's cer giants, get, there's Cerulean giants and Cerulean dragons. Cerulea is the continent that this place takes place on. Great, great card on the weapons and armor of the different races, which I love. This is a big part of my campaign, is that I always know what the technology level is. In fact, do they even say they don't? But in my write-ups, in my campaign setting, I, am, I talk about, like, do these guys, how do these guys keep time? Do they have, uh, what, what are their clocks like? Do they have plate mail technology? Do they have stirrups? Because if your game is set in the 11th century, if your game is set in a typical medieval 13th century, they didn't have stirrups yet. That hadn't that that invention um, wasn't the Mongols. That invention had not propagated out to Europe yet. So that I like that notion of of how, what types of armor do they have access to, and then and then I took that and propagated it out to other kinds of technology. So this what's this thing? What's this thing? This is the birthright DM screen. Doo -doo -doo very cool and it's got a lot of the stuff you need for DD, but it's also got stuff that's unique to birthright like do how domains work and stuff like that and uh and here's the front of it i love the art the art for birthright's great it's got saving throws in here you know your old school DD player if you still remember paralysis poison or death magic rod staff wand petrification polywarf breath weapon spell that's a that's actually I'm not I don't I don't dislike that system. I'm not sure why they changed it. Um How high fantasy is birthright? I would say it's medium to low fantasy actually. So yeah, really cool uh DM screen that I used uh, a lot. So they did a good job with this DM screen. The the default DM screen for 5th edition, I think they did a very bad job with it because they put into that first yeah, they've got a better one now. They've got a better one now. Good job, guys. But that first DM screen, you can tell that they made the DM screen to try to influence how you play. Because they thought, this is this DM screen, the 5th edition DM screen, is a chance to show people what D&D is about if you're new. So you open it up and it's all about how to create an NPC on the fly and give them motivation. It's all this narrative stuff. And I'm like, but is opening a door an action? Why was that a thing? Right? And that's the basic stuff that absolutely should be in a DM screen and was not there. Um, although there was one awesome thing in that uh, original 5th edition DM screen, the something happens chart, which I love. Great, great job. Here's the calendar. I think all good homebrew campaigns have a calendar with where you got days and names of the week. We did a whole episode on calendars and how the calendar of your world is like a window into the society. Because people, that when you start, if you've never wondered why are the days of the week, why are there seven days? Why are there 30 days in a month? Why are there 300? If you've never wondered these things, once you start making a calendar, and I think a lot of people have done this, a lot of teenagers, a lot of teenagers, and I'm one of them, sat down to make it. So I got to figure out what the day, surely it's not Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in my world. What is it? Well, you know, even though it was in um, Lord of the Rings, good enough for Tolkien, good enough for you. But uh, you sit down to think about what, what, what is my calendar like? You The cat is trying to fall asleep on a very tiny thing and is falling off. You are so floofy. You are the maximum floof cat. Yes, you are the floofiest kitty ever. My tiny house lion. You start thinking about what is, um, how do calendars work and why are they the way they are? And the answers are all baked into our culture. They have, oh, with one exception, maybe two. They have very little to do with the natural world. And they have everything to do with society and the different layers of society that have existed over centuries and eons. So uh, the, one of the first, one of the best first steps I think you can make in, a, in, a, in building a campaign world is building a calendar. Um, so this is the, um, so we're going to have a war, we're going to have a battle, and I've got to put this whole sheet out and you can see it's got sorry you can see it's got squares for putting the cards because there are all these maneuvers and stuff never used it um because i don't think a war should be separate from an encounter we came to play DD. this is the golden rule the players showed up to play DD. you might think a war is cool you might think a battle is neat but unless you know for certain that all six of them do don't just bust out some version of warhammer 
Warhammer, or in this case, sort of quasi battle lore, because some of your players are gonna be like, this is not what I came for. This is something I learned. It took me a long time to learn this. Why, don't, why aren't my players engaging with this stuff? Because they came to play D&D, &D, they wanna swing their sword and kill monsters. So a war happens while a, while a combat, while a battle is happening. And uh, that's, they're simultaneous. And it also gives context, like there's the enemy hero, we can get in a single combat with him. And whether I live and whether he lives affects the, or you know, the, the, the each, the, the, the skirmish that we're playing with these enemies where I'm moving my miniature and rolling to hit affects the battle and the battle affects the skirmish. So map, map of the big, big, big zoomed in map, overview map. And here is, uh, it, we don't need it. And then here, we're almost done folks. And then here's this box to put, ah, Krivens! This is the box that you put your cards in. They give you a bunch of cards. Gotta put you, give you a box to put in, which is cool. So that's it. That's the birthright setting, folks. So yeah, next, we'll do more uh, streams probably over the course of the week talking about the Kickstarter. But next Saturday, we're going to talk about another adventure. We talked about Red Hand of Doom last week. Don't know what the adventure is going to be. I'll have to think about it. Maybe Village of Hamlet, Temple of Elemental Evil? I don't know. You folks tell me. Reach out to me at Matt Colville on Twitter. Let me know what kind of adventure. Well, I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll be posting adventures and I'll be like, never played that one, never played that one. So it's going to have to be something that I can endorse. On that note, I believe we will be ending the stream. Uh, it is time for Evil Matt. There's good Matt and evil Matt. And if you're wondering which is which, I am the evil one. There is uh, time for evil Matt to go play with his Euro rack and get some food. Until the next time, peace out. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. We're not done. We're not done. Hang on. Everybody come back. Everybody come back. Stand by. Um, so there are two things I failed to mention that I thought were pretty cool in the Birthright stream. So those of you watching on YouTube, those of you who have stuck around for an hour, holy crap, you get this tiny little bit of bonus content. One of the cool things about Birthright that I liked was that there were a dozen of these cool little player player packets, player expansions called Player's Secrets. So once you, the Dungeon Master, and probably the player, figured out between the two of you which uh, domain the player was going to be the regent of, either you or they went out and got this. This is for Telinier. And I had, I, had, I had all the ones they made of these. I had like a dozen of them, and I can't find most of them because they're probably still with the players. But you got all sorts of cool stuff. I don't have the chat up now, so I can cheat and I can put my... I can put my readouts, handouts wherever I want. Uh, here's like the list of, in fact, let's let's get right up there because it'll focus. If it can't see my face, it'll focus in on what it needs to. Uh, the the lineage of the kings and stuff, and there's it's like a little it's like a little DM screen, right? You get like uh, here's your here's the map of your of your stronghold. Isn't that awesome? And you get uh, the, the zoomed in thing of your of your holdings and you know a local inn or a wizard tower or something like that. These are great. Excuse me, my cat is thinks it's cat time. Um, and so then you get a whole little player packet, right? And tips tips for the new region. A lot of politics. What are the politics of your area like? Who are the movers and shakers in your domain? Uh, what are your exports and imports? What are the different holdings? Remember, holdings are different sources of power. You have law holdings, and which are like you know uh, uh, barracks and where your soldiers are stationed. They keep the rule of law. And then you have guild holding, holdings, where the money comes from, and temple holdings, the people who are protecting the souls of your uh, of your of your people of your uh, citizens and then you have you know uh magic holding sources that wizards use and there's so there's a whole list of those in here and uh let's see what else the government and culture of the country which you know i think all this stuff is really well thought out the only problem with this stuff what are the natural resources what's the dangerous wildlife what kind of plants and animals are there can you find it's a little gazetteer uh what's the climate like so there's tons of information in here now the problem with this is that the player is going to get to this is this is it says players secrets it says that right here at the top of the thing players secrets the player is probably going to um, know this information really, really well. And that put a burden on you, the Dungeon Master, to know that stuff really, really well. And that's, I think, the fear of a lot of DMs running a pre-made campaign, Forgotten Realms, for instance, is that their players know more than they do. And I don't normally think that's a problem with the whole setting. 
right? With the whole setting, you can sort of say, listen, this is not the Forgotten Realms you know. It's my Forgotten Realms. It's a mirror universe Forgotten Realms. It's an alternate reality Forgotten Realms. It's the slightly less well-remembered realms. But when it comes to, like, a little patch of land that you hand out to your player and say, this is yours, it belongs to you, the, the expectation on the part of the player is that this stuff's all real. And that puts a heavy burden on you. There's a cool, a really cool one for the dwarves, Baruch Azik. Uh, so that is, that is the, um, those are the player's secrets handouts. Not, they're not handouts, they're products. The other thing that I failed to mention that I thought was really neat about Birthright, and I think the folks working even to this day on Dungeons and Dragons still like the idea because I think it has survived in the main game, is the Shadow World. It's detailed in the rule book. The Shadow World is basically the Shadow Fell. This is the first time we saw reference to something like that. You might think of it as the upside down, right? It is a version of the world of Birthright that is a dark, twisted version. And I believe it's where the elves come from. And I think that uh, one of the things they decided, because again, this was someone's fantasy setting for their fantasy novels, that they then had to graft a bunch of D&D stuff on it. Some things grafted better than others. They grafted halflings onto it. I got the sense halflings weren't originally in that fantasy setting. Might have been, might have been, I don't know. But the Shadow World, I believe the idea for halflings is that they live half in and half out. But uh, your your domain has its dark counterpart in the shadow realm in the shadow world and that's something that was pretty cool cool enough that they turned it into the shadow fell and everybody really liked that that was one of the things that people remember from fourth edition so that's it folks thanks for watching for real this time i was really happy with the way that stream went there's a link in the doobly-doo to the twitch stream where it's archived it's only archived there for about 30 days but if we stream enough this month and i think we're going to get there then we can become affiliates and then we can store things there for longer and eventually i think maybe forever so there was a lot of really good dungeon master advice i think in the live stream but it wasn't relevant to birthright so i cut it out and of course there's also a lot of nonsense it's a live stream that's part of the fun there are a lot of asides but if you're interested in the longer version by all means head over to twitch and you can watch the whole thing on video on demand we now return you to your normal skullduggery